Okay, so um, first, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I got involved with Astrofy starting a couple of years ago and really jumped in with both feet about a year ago. And I can still remember the how I felt when I submitted my first pull request and when I asked my first question on Astropy Dev, and um, they're very nice. So please get involved. A uh, couple groups I want to acknowledge, I wouldn't be here without financial support from a couple of different organizations. And I've got a bunch of students, all undergraduates back at home that I'm working with, and you'll see some of their work today. I want to give you a little bit of my context because I think it's different than the context a lot of you are in. I'm in an undergraduate only institution. Um, for an undergraduate only department in the US, we're pretty good sized. We'd get graduate seven or eight majors a year. Huge would be 10. If we, if we break into 10 or 11 majors a year, that puts us in the AIP list of big departments that are undergraduate only. Um, we have to remind administrators of that constantly. Um, we've got an astronomy emphasis and about half the majors um, uh, choose that astronomy emphasis, but not that many go to graduate school in astronomy. So part of what's driving my choices and part of what I've always got in the back of my mind is how is what I'm doing with students going to be useful for them given they are almost certainly not going to do astronomy professionally. Uh, like everybody else, I've got too much to do and not enough time. Um, and so that's another problem I've always got in the back of my head. How can I do two things at once or three things at once if at all possible? And the other thing to keep in mind is I'm primarily evaluated on teaching. Both in the so the question, first question that's asked is how is your classroom teaching going? As far as research goes, the question that's asked before how many publications have you had, what quality of those publications are, how many times they've been cited, the question that's asked is have you done it with students and what have the students gotten out of it? So it's coming from a little bit of a different um, focus. So I'll. I'm going to try to pull a Super Tom. So he did two lightning talks in, was it uh, five minutes, four minutes yesterday? So I've, I've got what could probably be three or four um, um, separate talks that I'll try to squeeze into one. Uh, so there's a few different ways I use AstroPy with undergraduates. Uh, code contributions, uh, we'll talk about in a moment. This turns out to be more important than I thought. Um, better homework, we saw a little bit of yesterday. I, in a lightning talk, showed you a widget-based notebook. In a couple of minutes, I'll show you what was turned in. Um, um, students are really enthusiastic to be involved in a larger project. So for them, testing AstroPy, uh, whether it's um, a sub-package or, or the core, and even just reporting a bug on GitHub. They feel good about it. They're part of something bigger. Um, and, and of course, we want to do science together. A um, little bit of advice for making code contributions, and I think this probably applies generally, not just undergraduates. Have them start small, and I recommend starting with code, not with documentation. The problem with documentation is that you have to know a little bit of Sphinx, and if you want to try out your document change, and they run into a Sphinx problem, all of a sudden you're talking about Sphinx. Um, and I'm pretty sure they're not going to get a job after they graduate by saying, hey, I know Sphinx. Um, become very good at seeing spaces that aren't there that should be or, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's uh, the exception to this is if you're going to have somebody make a contribution on GitHub itself just using the pencil icon, fairly easy. But other than that, um, I, I find when I've tried doing documentation, um, it, it ends up being much more difficult. Um, just like us here this week, you have to actively mentor them. So expect them to come into your office fairly frequently. Um, what I really like about code contributions also is it gives me a way to introduce the idea of unit testing. That's going to be important if they do any software development after they graduate. I think it ought to be much more important in, so in science than it is. Um, if you want to see a good example, so I'm going to give shouts out to some of my students. Go here. Um, he's been uh, working through some old issues in CCD proc. And, you know, beginning of last week when I was thinking about this talk, I thought, oh, well, you know, it's, he's made some contributions. They're not huge, but, and then he, he came t to my office uh, last Wednesday, I think, and said, Matt, I got, I can help me figure out I, this unit test. I've, I've done seven or eight of them, and, and they're all working, but this last one, it, I cannot get my test to work. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And so I peeked at his test, and then I peeked at the code it was testing, and I was like, congratulations, Nathan. You found your first real bug. <laughs> Um, 
um, which turned out to be useful in another way because that's the issue that Jennifer solved the other day. So um, what it reminded me of, I think, is that there is value in getting new people involved and um, important contributions can come from unexpected places. So this particular bug that he found meant that um, CCD proc was modifying the input image <coughs> accidentally. Yeah. Ah, right, so that homework that I talked about briefly yesterday got turned in today. Um, so there's a couple, so you're, you're not intended to be able to read the details of this. So a couple things to point out about it. Uh, this was one of the widget based graphs yesterday where you had sliders, you could change omega matter, omega dark matter, whether or not you had a flat model. Those widgets don't get saved in the notebook. What's saved is the, is the last graph. One of the things that this combination of, of widgets and um, um, AstroPy allows is you know, the meat of the assignment, or, or one important piece of the assignment was find four or five, actually it's kind of funny, one place the assignment said three, another place it said four, and another place it said five, um, <laughs> different models um, that fit the supernova data pretty well um, with various constraints. So a flat model, an empty model, a uh, model where the Hubble constant is realistic and a model where the Hubble constant isn't realistic. Um, prior to this, we had done work with um, some of the easier cases, um, you know, matter only universe, uh, radiation only universe, just so they have some experience with the underlying mathematics um, so that this process is, isn't entirely a black box. <coughs> and when we you know, meet again next week, this is the work of another student, um, you know, we can talk about the differences and what they found. You know, is this really a good fit? When I was in graduate school, it would have been, that would have been a great fit because <laughs> The error bars would have been that big. <laughs> Everything was a great fit. I was at breakfast the other day and someone said something about two values of the Hubble con constant being inconsistent. And I said, what do you mean by inconsistent? One was 71 and one was 68 or something. It's like, wow. <laughs> I remember uh, when it was uh, 35 versus 100. Um, so, Example is some of the science I'm doing with the students, the role I find myself playing is that of uh, mostly software writers so that they can measure the timing of exoplanet transits, looks for variables in those um, exoplanet fields. Uh, we've done some HR diagrams of uh, open clusters, not, that's not so much research as getting a better handle on astrophysics. And um, um, looking at our Leary without measured periods or these odd things, there's still a few of them around, stars that are listed in variable star catalogs as our Leary's, no period. I don't know how that happens, but. Um, so to do that science, right, you have to take images. We've got a telescope, that's not so bad. Um, I had a few years ago written some software to um, add useful meta metadata like WCS. It's like Lemon except not as well written or as well documented or as convenient. <laughs> so um, I guess that's the difference. You call yours a lemon, mine is a lemon. Um, <laughs> then you've got to do reduction, source ex extraction, so on. So the software has got to support Windows. About half my students will be working on Windows machines. Um, it's got to have a short learning curve. Uh, I might have a semester working with them, maybe two. Um, I want it, the results to be credible, so it's got to be something that's either widely used or, or we can <coughs> just look at the source code and, and make sure that um, it, it's doing what it says and it needs to leave behind a record so that we can build on progress. A um, little bit of practical advice, have them learn just a little bit of terminal and there's this great resource, I will put all these slides online, I know you can't read the links so don't, there will be too many, you won't be able to write them down. Um, what's really nice about this is that it's broken up into very small discrete tasks and they've got Linux, Mac, and Windows. On Windows they use PowerShell, so on Windows you should use PowerShell. Right? It's hard enough without having to teach them terminal. Um, and really all they need for using IPython notebooks anyway, and even a little bit of Python, is the ability to change directories, see what's in a directory, maybe remove directories. So it doesn't take them very long to get through this. And for Python use Anaconda, mostly for that reason. I think these are easier um, in Anaconda. And if you've got packages that need compilation, it's not that hard to build them in Anaconda and then um, provide them to students. 
So what are the options? IRAF. No concerns about the quality in terms of the science it produces, but not Windows <laughs> um, and not learning curve. Um, commercial has both good, bad, and ugly. Um, and it's the ugly that really is a, the stumbling point for me, that you don't really know what they're doing under the hood. Uh, I'm going to give a quick shout out. This is not actually Python. It's um, written in Java, um, but it's the uh, program I started using. It's got a great GUI, um, lots of features, so it can do image reduction. It can do uh, uh, photometry. It can graph light curves for you. You can uh, change which stars are in, in your comparison set. Um, it has so many good things I had to keep going, and I won't read them all to you. Um, got a couple of issues, many of which are really issues with me, not issues with the program. Java gets hard for me. I don't need to get in a debate about whether it's a good or a bad thing um, in an absolute sense. It uses file names to figure out what the calibration files are and what the science images are. That's a problem because I'm error prone in the middle of the night when I'm naming files. So um, like any good scientist with an interest in programming, I thought to myself, I know the solution is to start to sit down and write something from scratch. Um, and then I remembered, wait, there exists AstroPy. And um, started looking at AstroPy and realized that, I need to change resolution here. Yeah. There we go. Um, CCD proc hadn't been written, um, so I emailed Steve Crawford, like you said yesterday, and said, hey, Steve, can I help? And uh, once again, I still remember that, that knot in my stomach when I sent that email thinking, I don't know what's going to happen here, but it turned out great. Um, so what I'm going to walk you through now is this reduction notebook, and we'll spend the rest of the time on this. So I wanted to make this um, fairly undergraduate friendly. Um, <coughs> so there are buttons for lots of things. Um, I actually find it fairly convenient for me too. So built into it is a image browsing widget. Um, so you can look at the individual um, images. Uh, these, these are not space telescope images with lots of cosmic rays. That's what happens when you take 16-bit images, uh, cut them in half uh, dimension-wise and drop the resolution or drop the depth by a uh, factor of two and compress it so that you can distribute it with the um, package. And you can look at the headers if you need to, or want to. Um, then there are a series of widgets for doing things like subtracting the overscan. Um, at the moment, it doesn't understand bias sec and trim sec. I was going to say later this week, but it's Friday. so. <laughs> Probably not later this week. Um, it's got a very, very, very minimal um, you know, error checking in the sense that um, it's not until you have some sensible settings in for at least one of these things so that you actually be doing something with an image that you get a button that says, okay, you're good. And then Once I've trimmed all of those images, presumably you want to combine them. And we'll see, I'm not going to go through all these settings right now because we'll see them used in a moment. So go ahead. So this maybe looks like a lot of widgets at first, but it was actually many of these objects are being reused, so it's not so bad. And we'll take a look at the object hierarchy in a minute. Oh, incidentally. Um, pull request opportunity. <laughs> Created in this notebook basically means that assuming there's a file in the directory that um, it can, uh, th that has particular keywords in the header. Um, you c so this, this source the folder that's pulling the data from has a whole mess of dark files and a bunch of different exposure times. So you can group them by exposure time. So it'll combine all the five second darks, 10 second darks, whatever <coughs> they are. And make 
those. So there are more widgets like that. Let me step back a second and show you what the um, class hierarchy looks like. So everything from container widget that way is IPython. So um, I started with a container that I could turn on and off. So one of those examples, or examples of that are each of these individual checkboxes or container widgets. This whole cell itself is a container widget, or sorry, is a, a toggle container widget. Um, I wanted to use that mechanism with the go buttons that turn on and off, so subclass from there. And then from, from those, make each of the uh, two main widgets which are being used in the reduction. One that uh, does the normal operations to reduce an image, and then a separate one that combines images. So it's another way AstroPy saved my bacon. Thank you, AutoModSum. I guess thanks, Eric. You probably wrote that. Um, and if it wasn't that Eric, it's the other Eric. Uh, there's really not that many methods and attributes in here. Essentially, these container widgets um, have a child, um, and each of those uh, containers can, can define a um, method that tells its parent whether or not its settings are sensible. Do, 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 do. What else to say? And you can have, not with this, but with one of the subclasses, you can also, oh, there it is. You can add an action. So um, the setup here is that each one of those widgets can do something, and the combined widget and the reduction widget um, take care of tying all of those steps together. So in, in those, those sections with the buttons, they contained all of these different kinds of widgets. There's this great design um, pattern called MVC, Model View Controller. I wish I'd understood that before I started writing code. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, if you start browsing through the code at all, you're going to find that, um, well, in principle, I think documentation is great. And am I over? Two minutes over. OK. <laughs> Two minutes over. Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Matt. So, do you have any quick questions for Matt? Yep. So, this looks pretty great. Like, it's great to keep the Have you had other folks asking you if they can use it? Have you tried uh, spreading the word around at all? Or is this, you know, you're still kind of in beta mode? I mean, I would like to see this. I would like my former institutes to use this. Like that. Uh, around the US. So, it is, sorry, it is up on PyPy, pip install, minus minus pre reducer. Hopefully later today, the minus minus pre will go away. Uh, to run it in a, in a, in a shell, you, you go to the folder where you want the reduce data to end up, type reducer, that makes this notebook, and start up PyPython notebook the usual way. So are you <coughs> this, is, this, is the, this is the rollout. 